Do you think it's still an industry, Michael? A really no. an industry? It's not an industry like it used to be, that's no. for sure. And I wonder if it really was. I think it was a kind of... I think it always was show business. The growing list of celebrities who have left Los Angeles in recent years. Some of the attention is not good. It's inflated. And if you buy into that, it begins a downward slide. I think it's all bull. I think it's just gross. I mean, Hollywood's a weird town anyway. It brags about itself constantly. All it does is talk about how much money it makes. Dark energy that this industry was built on. Hollywood, right? We've heard of it. Ask anyone today and they'll tell you it symbolizes stardom and glamour. It's kind of a big deal to most couch-ridden middle-aged retirees and terminally online teenagers. Now, Hollywood isn't just superhero movies and Dwayne The Rock Johnson. There's also Kevin Hart. But before the rise of the holy trinity of modern cinema, there was... Farmland. Like, I'm not even kidding, they erected the sign reading Hollywood Land with just like miles of the most aggressively boring landscape you could imagine. Then in 1949, they thought, drop the land, just Hollywood. It's cleaner. But hang on, hang on. We're jumping like 60 years here. <coughs> Hollywood the brainchild of real estate mogul H.J. Whitley, who was responsible for bringing electric, telephone, and gas lines into the suburbs. In 1910, due to inadequate water supply, Hollywood decided to consolidate with Los Angeles, merging to create what would eventually become the most obnoxiously overhyped, overly glamorized, merging to create the Hollywood we know and love today. It's taken well over a hundred years to get here, which is the same amount of time we've had to wait for GTA 6. Now, movies were wildly popular at the turn of the 20th century and were almost exclusively made by aid studios. The most notable ones being Paramount, Fox Film Corporation, Warner Brothers, RKO, wrong clip, hang on, RKO and Lowe's. They ruled Hollywood throughout the late 20s and 50s, seeing substantial growth during the Great Depression given the escapism of the silver screen. Now these films had to follow a set of rules known as the production code. It sounds way more edgy and cool than it actually is. The goal of this rule was to uplift and coddle an already disheveled public. Basically a bunch of serious businessmen in suits got together and said no profanity, nudity, or controversial topics on screen because we don't know how to emotionally process any context that is and spoon fed. Nonetheless, rebel directors and writers would slip subtext through the cracks, most of which going unnoticed until years or even decades later. This golden age would end with the rise of home television, which at the time were like six bajillion dollars, so it took a bit for the theater trend to wind down. Thus began the era of global media consumption. So, picture this. The year is, I don't know, 1955. Your Instagram doesn't exist, so you have to find somewhere else to watch reposted TikToks. YouTube is gone too, so there goes any chance I have at quitting retail. It's just you, a television, and the overly tense marriage you were pressured into at 19. You're shown everything from current events to upcoming television shows. Oh boy, did this look good. To the weather. There's just one major problem. You have zero outside information. There's no forums for alternative ideas. Is nothing different from whatever media conglomerates are spoon feeding you and the misses. Unless your parents paid for some super artsy college where free thinking was like the cool thing to do. So that begs the question who could be pulling the strings here? The production companies, of course. Hollywood taking doomerism to a completely new level, stoking fear in everyone else but the beautiful land that is Tinseltown. When you have a monopoly on public perception, it's very easy to skew reality, even at such a massive scale. Come to Hollywood, there's stars on every street corner, pristine streets, high-end fashion and food, and luxury vehicles. But in reality, it's held a deeper, darker secret. It sends you out there with hopes and dreams. It tells you that it's not going to be easy, but they really don't tell you how hard it's really going to be. 
As the Chili Peppers would say, it's understood that Hollywood sells Californication. This idea that anybody can become somebody. They glamorize the struggle, pitching the idea that the journey makes the destination all that much sweeter. Like if you went broke chasing your dreams, it doesn't matter because you were in a planner's commercial like three years ago, forever immortalized into the digital realm. So then over decades, this oversaturation led to incredibly cheap and exploited labor and skyrocketing rent prices. Landlords were making a killing. Production companies could hire actors for pennies with the idea that the exposure was payment enough. After all, there was no alternative. No YouTube algorithm to try and beat, no following to share content with. Filmmaking was wildly expensive. You were at the mercy of whatever production company was funding the current and hottest projects. But then something kind of crazy happened. Tonight, the information superhighway and one of its main thoroughfares, an online network called Internet. What about this internet thing? Do you, do you know anything about that? Sure. What was your vision? Well, computer on every desk and in every home. Since the dawn of the World Wide Web, our attention span has shrunk into about the size of Christian Bale's temper. No, don't just be sorry. Think for one f second. Around the turn of the new millennium, the internet began opening the doors to superstardom for people who don't actually do anything. The early 2000s spawned the rise of pop culture and social media icons like Tila Tequila and Paris Hilton. People could become famous for just, I don't know, being attractive, I guess. It wasn't surprising to begin seeing people pluck from obscurity. This was and I know this is gonna sound a little controversial, actually a good thing. What an idiot! Oh, what a loser! Okay, all right, all right. So hear me out. There's this thing in Hollywood and like basically in every industry, but significantly more of an issue in Hollywood. Now this thing is called nepotism, which is defined as the practice among those with power or influence of favoring relatives or friends, especially by giving them jobs. So we're going to play a little rapid fire game of I bet you didn't know they were nepotism babies with some currently famous stars you may recognize today. Ready? Maud Apatow, whose parents are Leslie Mann and Judd Apatow, Margaret Qualley, whose mother is Annie McDowell, Zoe Dutch, whose mom is Leah Thompson, Lily Collins, whose dad is Phil Collins, Emma Roberts, whose aunt is Julia Roberts, Dave Franco, Jake Gyllenhaal, Josh Brolin, and Angelina Jolie. Did you know that f***ing Nicolas Cage's uncle was Francis Ford Coppola, whose daughter is Oscar-winning screenwriter and director Sofia Coppola, whose aunt is Talia Shire? I feel like half of the Godfather cast is related. The point here that I'm trying to make is it doesn't matter how good of an actor you were or how strongly you landed your in-person audition when some kid in sweats submitted five second iPhone 4 footage from his home and landed the role you had been studying for weeks because his dad was the owner of like Australia or something and he thought it'd be a fun thing to do like a cute part-time hobby and if it sounds like I'm a hater it's because I am. Nepotism isn't going away anytime soon. The best way to combat it is by building your own audience. So how exactly do you do this? Well, you could be creative in your work, consistent in your effort, loyal to your following, and maybe, maybe after years of grinding, grueling mental strain, you'll eventually get an internship at BuzzFeed making just enough to live out of your car. There's this comedian I really like named Luke Monez who basically summed it up in one single tweet. The tweet reads, when I did my first open mic as a fresh-faced college kid, it was my dream to one day post my material in 8 second clips, sweating blood for an algorithm, losing all connection with my creativity in hopes of getting a high score in an arbitrary content pachinko game. Now, by almost every standard, Luke is what most people grinding in this industry would deem a success. He's got a strong audience, consistently funny content. The one thing Luke can escape, or seemingly any other comedian for that matter, is the upkeep. The algorithms on these social media platforms force you to adapt constantly, creating content about topics you might not want to talk about, pandering to a crowd whose attention spans are limited to whatever's trendy at the moment. The Keanu Reeves video I posted early on in my page I only did because I thought it would gain traction. Keanu's a consistently popular internet culture topic. I doubt a video on like how cute my dog is would have done this well. And he's like super cute. I Look at him. And do you want to know what the worst part about this whole thing is? You could spend years waiting for a bus that might never actually come. You have to genuinely love doing this in order to keep going. But wait, wait. For those seeking a bolder approach, there is an alternative. There's a new viral internet sensation spurring a nationwide crime spree. <laughs> <laughs> ah! 
they are even ending up with severe injuries. Now, most people, of course, will opt for the quicker route. With this new culture of short form content, controversy will get you clicks over creativity almost every single time. Why compete with hundreds of thousands of aspiring influencers when you can just crush a fruit stall or harass a drive through employee? There's also a third way, but this one isn't intentional. Just ask the likes of Alex from Target, Dan Daniel, Ken Bone, and my personal favorite, the viral video of Nathan Apodaca riding his skateboard to Fleetwood Mac and what is possibly the most chill video of all time. While while one of the two latter options leads to significantly more backlash and bullying, they both follow somewhat of the same trajectory. So picture this, you make a silly little video that you're sure will amount to nothing, and you leave it at that. You wake up one morning to find the content that you thought for sure would get lost in the cesspool of social media has now gone viral. Not just viral, but your phone is blowing up, relatives you haven't spoken to in years are suddenly visiting, you're the man now. Your notifications reflect that, and so does your skyrocketing follower count. This is a high like you've never felt before. And then, it isn't just your relatives calling. Your local news station, television personalities, podcasters, late night talk show hosts, even Ellen, who you promptly declined for moral reasons, but now, you're even getting hounded in public for pictures. You're at your peak. And what does that mean? It means it's time to capitalize. You get an email. It says they work with a renowned agency. They want to represent you. This is it. This is what those years you've spent daydreaming at work have been leading up to. You've cashed your fast track ticket to superstar and all you have to do is make t-shirts? Yeah. Oh man, this one's gonna be painful to talk about. Whatever, the agency knows best, so does your newly found management who just happens to be your cousin George. It'll take months for you to get all the merch items delivered, so you have to opt for a quicker route, a website that'll handle orders and delivery in bulk on your behalf. All of them take roughly half of what you're charging. The quality is subpar and customer satisfaction is never guaranteed, but you don't have a choice. You need to move quickly. Now you wait and wait and wait. You manage to sell a couple thousand dollars worth of gear. After giving half to the distributor, paying your management and agency, you're left with a crisp $600. Not bad for a day's work. After all, this is your audience. These people are here for you and they intend to stay. Which means this should last forever. This is where reality begins to sink in. Remnants of past memes. Some are still around, able to adapt by either leaning into a character or taking different pursuits creatively, but the vast majority couldn't keep up with the shifting social media climate. And then there's you. You thought they'd still love you after the first 72 hours, but your phone is no longer ringing, your cousin goes back to selling weed out of his apartment, and your agency says they're no longer seeking out a partnership. But why? Do the tides of social media flow that quickly? Can your relevance dwindle that fast? Yeah. It absolutely can. Like many before you, you're back into the usual routine. Your former dreams of superstardom now seem like a distant memory. You still get recognized, but it's more like a, hey, you're that guy from that one thing, right? Kind of recognition. You went from having the world's attention to just being another average member of the general public. For anyone who's experienced this come down, it's close to unbearable. It's why you see a number of overnight celebrities damn near self-destruct after the initial wave of fame. Then you ask yourself, was the longer option really that bad to begin with? Overnight success Successes like Boon Gang or Ken Bone can be frustrating to creatives who spend countless hours grinding away at an algorithm that seemingly enslaves content creators by demanding constant maintenance. But honestly, they're both kind of necessary. Ken Bone only blew up because of the countless creatives and regular online people who used his image to farm engagement. There's a mutual benefit here. While one might skyrocket to fame at a faster pace, the other one has longevity. While it's not fun grinding or churning out content on a regular basis, you gain the ability to consider consistently stay afloat in a highly competitive market. Also, people just like you more. You're far less likely to get bullied because you're just inherently more valuable to your following when you're not a passing trend. But wait, 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 wait. All of this is online. You're probably thinking, why would I need to move to Los Angeles or New York if I'm building my audience? And honestly, I don't think most people do, at least not yet. The big issue people have is that they move prematurely. They don't have a strong foundation, little to no funding to live off of, and end up taking the walk of shame back to their parents' house because they left grad school to pursue comedy or acting without any prior gigs or experience. Then they make videos on YouTube crying about nepotism or Hollywood. Anyway, in short, if you don't have an uncle who's a hotshot director, a dad who's comedy royalty, or an aunt who's an Oscar winner, just 
Take some time in your affordable hometown, do a little trial and error, and see if you can build something without throwing yourself into the deep end. You'd be surprised. I think you're more capable than you realize.